We're going to be looking at God's Word, and in particular, we're looking at John chapter 17, verse 17 to 19. John chapter 17, verse 17 to 19. And as we do that, I want to draw our attention to God's Word. John 17, 17 to 19. Listen to God's word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Amen. This is God's word. Uh, In recent weeks, um, we have focused on the four core values uh, so far, three of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, and let me just let me just by by way of introduction, invite you to tell me what those four core values are. So let's start with the first one, which is today's truth. What's the next three? Worship. Okay, that was kind of weak. Next one is community and. Okay, let's say that all again, all at the same time. It's going to be on the screen there. Ready? Here it is. Truth. Worship, community, mission. These are the four core values of Sheridan Hills. If you want to know what is Sheridan Hills all about, these four words are very important. Now, if you missed the first two messages, which were on community and mission, go on YouTube or go on our website, and you can look at those, uh, those videos. They're going to be very helpful for you as you begin to think about what is my identity as part of this church? What do I believe about the church. And so this morning we come to truth. Uh, First we looked at community just September 30th. We looked at the fact that true Christians gather with other Christians in loving Christ-centered community. That's what true Christians do. They gather in community. This morning we're gathering in community. At growth group hour, you're gathered in community. Some of you had community group meetings this week in your homes. Uh, Those are those are the places where we can rub shoulders and learn and grow from each other. Last week we heard about mission. We are on mission with Jesus Christ. We are walking in his footsteps to proclaim the gospels and all to proclaim the gospel in all the world. We saw that true Christians make disciples locally and globally. So if you're a true Christian, this is going to be true of you. You are making disciples whether it's your own biological children, whether it's people in the church here, whether it's your coworkers, or people perhaps that you teach in a school setting, you are actively a participant in making disciples, both locally and globally. So we talked about what the short-term mission trips look like. What about local trips? What about local evangelism? What about personal conversations, one-on-one conversations? And we saw that true Christians indeed make disciples locally and globally. And so today we come to this, this idea of truth. We come to this idea of truth. And I want us to see that this is actually a biblical, rooted deeply in, in the scripture, and in fact, in what Jesus prays in John chapter 17. We see that true Christians think, feel, and act in holiness. They think, feel, and act in holiness as a result of God's truth, his word. So true Christians think, feel, and act in holiness. They do this as a result of hearing God's truth, of receiving God's truth, his word. So this morning as you're hearing the words from John 17, verse 17 to 19, as you're hearing me talk, you are thinking, feeling, and act, and perhaps acting, and your acting, your feeling, your thinking is going to be transformed. It's going to be made holy. In fact, that's what Jesus prays for us. But before we dive right into the text, I want to give us a little bit of context here. Why are we today here at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church in 2018, and how do we come here? Who do we stand on? On whose shoulders? And what we'll see, what what we're celebrating this month is the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. And I want us to see that this idea of truth is the primary reason for why the Protestant Reformation had to take place. In fact... Today, even today, there is a reformation going on. It has not ended. 
It's not like 501 years ago, this cataclysmic event happened called the Protestant Reformation, and everything was set and set right, and everybody was just happy, and, and we've kind of moved on, and now we're talking about other things. No. Today, we are just as uh, prone to reforming the church as we were 501 years ago. Why? Because our hearts tend to go back into their sinfulness. Our hearts are so deceptive. So what do you need? What does every generation need? We saw it in Deuteronomy 6. Every generation needs God's word. And we'll see here that the Reformation, in large part, arose due to the gradual neglect of truth, that is God's word, during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages, during the medieval period. And you see the, the chart there on the screen, and you also see it in your handout, that the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, medieval period, this took a span of about a thousand years. So we're talking about Jesus' death, then we have these Christians that come from Jesus who, who are following him after his resurrection. They see and they go and they proclaim and the book of Acts tells us that thousands came and believed and the gospel went forth to Judea, Samaria and all the ends of the earth. I mean, it went all the way up to Northern Europe. It, got, it spread all the way into West Asia and it started going into North Africa. And then as a result, a couple hundred years pass and now we start seeing all these heresies. Remember, the, the, the natural default of the human heart is to go back into wickedness, into, into sinfulness. What does it need? It needs truth. And so, for several hundred years after Jesus' death and resurrection, you see these heresies, these false teachings pop up. In fact, most of the New Testament is dedicated to this topic of false teaching. How do you protect the church from false falsehoods, from lies about God, about Jesus Christ? Uh, one, popular, uh, one popular heresy that's also uh, uh, propagated today is that Jesus Christ is actually not, uh, not the Son of God that exists co-eternally with the Father. He is created and he becomes God. That's one of the heresies that the early church dealt with. And do you see why it's so important? Because history repeats itself. There's a large group, a geographically based group in the United States that currently believes that Jesus is a created being that becomes God. If they just read church history, they would have seen that this kind of was, you know, viewed as heresy 300 years after Jesus was, after he died and rose from the dead. But see, we don't know history. We don't know where we come from. And so as a result, we repeat the same mistakes. And remember, our heart default is sin. And so what we need is God's truth. And so I've, I've just prepared a couple of statements there. I want you to see these. I want you to see these statements here. How does reform happen? How does reform happen? How will it happen at Sheridan Hills? How will it happen today in 2018? Well, let's look back. Let's look at history. Let's see how it happens. Most reform, that is getting the church back to God's word. How do we get the church back to God's word today? Most reform took place not from the top down, not from the top of society and the church, that is in politics or through the Pope or other church leaders. That's not how it happened in the Reformation. How did it happen? It happened from low levels, starting with individuals. Think about this. You've heard of the name John Wycliffe, Wycliffe Bible Translators, the biggest translation, Bible translation organization out there that translates the Bible. John Huss, Peter Waldo, Martin Luther, John Calvin, these were all individuals. The low levels of society. It happened, reform happens through small church communities that gather locally, that preach the gospel faithfully week in and week out. And it also happens through small monk communities called monasteries. That's how it happened. That's how the Reformation happened. That's how the light of God's word came back. And listen to this next one. The reformers and their forerunners were largely concerned with ad fontes, which means going back to the sources. You should be concerned about that. Brother and sister, this morning, you should be concerned about whether I am going back to the source or if I'm just giving you some ideas that I thought about. You should be thinking, is what he's saying in the Bible? Is it going back to the source? And so that's what the reformers were really concerned with. Is the Catholic Church teaching ad fontes? Are they going back to the scriptures, or are they making new traditions to fit 
the politics, the economy of that time. And so we see that going back to the sources means going back to God's word, God's truth. And then listen to this. They had come, the reformers had come to know that God's word is the only source of true enlightenment. Is the only source of true enlightenment. And thus the phrase, post tenebrous lux. Now that's it. if you Google that right now, you're going to see a movie that just came out like a couple of years ago. That's not, that has nothing to do with the Reformation, so just ignore that. But what post-tenebrous Luke's means is this, after darkness, light. Think about that. The Dark Ages, why are they called the Dark Ages? Because there's darkness, <laughs> right? There's no, there's relatively no preaching of God's word happening. Now, some brothers and sisters were preaching God's word faithfully. In fact, music, church music, exploded during this time. We see this very, very uh, prevalent in, in music history, for instance, that truth was still sung. But post tenebrous Luke's had to deal with a bigger problem. It dealt with this bigger problem, and, and Eric Spee mentioned this earlier. It was getting the Bible translated into the native language of each country. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Now, during this time, if you came to church, like this morning, if you came to church and I was speaking like, I, you know, I speak Romanian, if I was speaking Romanian to you right now, you'd think, what is this guy saying? Most people who went to church during this time were thinking, what is this guy saying? Because they spoke in Latin. They didn't understand it. So can you imagine coming to church every Sunday and saying, I got to come here even though I don't understand anything? Aren't you so grateful that we speak in English? Aren't you grateful that you can understand what I'm saying right now? Well, how did that happen? It happened because these guys, John Wycliffe and his followers after he died, translated the Bible into English. And then we get all of these different translations. And so we have English. Martin Luther translates the Bible into German. The vernacular of that day, the Bible is now understood. And this causes a huge explosion. People start hearing the gospel. They start hearing justification by, by faith alone, grace alone through Christ alone. That's what salvation is. Now, this became the motto of the Protestant Reformation. It should be our motto today, too. We should think, let's go back to the sources. Let's go back to what true enlightenment is. And so God answers. I want us to see that in John 17, God answers the prayer of Jesus through the Protestant Reformation. Do you realize that? What we just read, Jesus' prayer? Sanctify them by thy truth, your word is truth. Jesus prays this prayer, and it's answered in the Protestant Reformation. It's answered in a powerful way. But not only that, not only through the Protestant Reformation, today in your hearing of God's word, this prayer, this prayer of Jesus is answered. I want us to think a little bit about truth in our society today. Truth, what's at stake in the message I'm going to be preaching this morning? What's at stake in our foundational truth that that truth, worship, community, mission is what's central to the identity of Sheridan Hills. What's at stake? Let me tell you, you guys ever watched the movie A Few Good Men? Do you know that part that's seen when Tom Cruise gets jugular veins and he says, I want the truth. And uh, um, the response is, well, you can't handle the truth. You remember that? In our culture, truth has become this very abstract idea. Uh, in a recent, on a recent uh, television show on a news channel, a, law, a famous lawyer, former mayor, says this, truth is not truth. My version of truth is not your version of truth. Now, he, now what he was saying in context was, look, people, people bring all sorts of allegations, and the reality is that I can say one thing and somebody can say another thing, it's his word against mine, and both of them are called truth. So truth has become relativized in our culture today. So we can't handle it, but it's also very, you know, just fluid. It, it really doesn't stick to anything. Uh, and then you also have this, this is from a popular movie today, and, and some of you might know this is, this is a character who says, the truth is a matter of circumstance. It's not all things to all people all the time. Okay, wrap your mind around that. Listen to that again. The truth is a matter of circumstance. It's not all things to all people all the time. 
So if I feel like gravity exists today, it exists today. If I don't feel like it exists tomorrow, I'll start floating. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. Because her statement is wrong. It's not true. So how do we look at truth as Christians today? There's a spectrum here. I want us to notice the spectrum. I'm going to give you this. All truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. It is absolute. Do you understand what? So if we say that God is holy, God is love, God is patient, God is kind, that's all true. Why is that all true? Because it has to do with God. So if we say gravity is true, why is that true? It's because God created it. Everything comes from God. And yet on the other side, we have this, that truth is a matter of circumstance. It just, it's how we view it in, in each time. Uh, truth is also progressive. Do you ever realize that? Truth is progressive. So for instance, before uh, Esther and I got married, I had 30 you know, um, theories about how marriage is going to work. I thought marriage is gonna work this way, and I had a, you know, I, I laid it out, I, I wrote a spreadsheet and everything, and I said, this is how it's gonna work out. I got married, and forget about it. The 30, 30 ideas went, went away. The same thing happened when, when I be, before I became a parent. Uh, Esther was pregnant, and we were, you know, we were looking at this whole thing, and we said, let me read all the parenting books. I'm gonna formulate my hypotheses now and my theories, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna kick this sucker out of the park, all right? We're gonna, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get a kid and we're gonna do just the right thing. And we get a kid, and we didn't. We, we, th we threw out that playbook too. It's because truth is progressive. The younger you are, the less experience you have, the less truth you're accustomed to. The older you are, the more truth you've seen, the more experience you've had, and hopefully the more you have become wise. And so truth is progressive. God's truth to us is progressive too. God doesn't tell us in Genesis chapter one that I'm going to send my son Jesus Christ to die for the sins of the world, and if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. Does he say that in Genesis one? No, he doesn't. He says, I'm the creator of the world. That's the first thing God wants us to know about him. He's the creator of the world, and everything flows from him. So when we talk about truth, we talk about truth flowing from God. Everything is from God. And so I want us to make two major observations from John chapter 17, two major observations. Listen to these two major observations so, you can orient, so we can get oriented on John chapter 17. Uh, in John chapter 17, we see a shift to the final hours of Jesus just before the crucifixion, okay? So this is right before Jesus' death. And Jesus says in John chapter 17 verse one, the hour has come. Now, that points us to this climax of his death and resurrection. All throughout this letter, he's been saying, my time has not come yet. Remember the first, the first miracle, the first sign is turning water into wine. And um, when Jesus' mother asks him, hey, can you do this? He says, woman, my time has not come yet. And throughout the letter, you kind of get a, 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 a sense of crescendo as Jesus is saying, my time has not come yet. And then in chapter 12, he says, my time is coming. And now, finally, the last time in the book of John, Jesus finally says, my hour has come. And so, what does John want us to see here? John wants us to see that Jesus, all throughout this book, has been doing the business of God. He has been listening to the truth of God. And now, finally, in the last hour, just before his death, he's going to listen, and he's going to follow God. And so, the hour has come. Listen to this, John chapter 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And you see, Jesus, right before he goes to his death, is in prayer. It's a good lesson to us as Christians that when we're about to face a major trial, what do we do? We go to Jesus, we go to, Jesus, we go to God, and we say, God, be with us. Be with me. Let yourself glorify yourself in me. Let your, let your name be magnified in me right now, is what Jesus says right before his death. Also, the second observation we need to see here is in, verse, is in verses 17 to 19. And they're, they're a part of Jesus' prayer. This whole chapter is Jesus' prayer for himself and for his followers. Now, just take a moment and appreciate the fact that we have this text we have a prayer of Jesus on our behalf. Do you realize how, how amazing that is? John tells us in, in another part of his gospel, he says, of all the things I could have written, 
I chose these things carefully so that you might believe. And this prayer is very intentionally placed in God's word for us, and I I want us to see why. Look at the first thing he prays for there in verses one to five. He prays for his own glorification. That is, after his death, Jesus prays to God, He, he prays, let me glorify you by rising from the dead. Remember, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And so when Jesus is praying, let me glorify myself, he's saying, after my death is glory. Let that happen. Then he prays this, for his disciples, he prays for his disciples in particular, apart from the world. He's not praying for the world here. He's very intentional about that. He does not pray for the world here. He says, I'm praying for my people, those who you have given to me, I have not lost them, not one of them. That should be encouraging to you. If you become a Christian, Jesus will never let you go. Look at, look at this, the next one, the third bullet point there. For his disciples, he prays for his disciples to be protected from the evil one. Aren't you encouraged by that? The fact that Jesus is raising prayers right now, eternally, for you to not fall prey to the evil one. Take a moment and let that encourage you. It's because of Jesus' prayer on our behalf that we can escape the snare of Satan. No sin with the Holy Spirit in our life, no sin is going to be hard to overcome with God's Spirit in us. Why? Because Jesus prays for us. Now listen to this one. This is where we are this morning. He prays for his disciples to be sanctified in truth. That's the fourth bullet point there. He prays for his disciples to be sanctified in the truth. Now it's the only way we'll see that God wants us. It's the only way that God sees us being transformed. It's the only way. It's through truth. And this truth, is, we'll see, is not abstract. It's something I can hold on to. It's something that is easy to understand. It's something that God himself will reveal to us very clearly. And so we'll see that in just a couple moments. Look at the next two bullet points there. Jesus prays for his future believers to be united. Maybe you're not a believer this morning. Do you know Jesus prays for you? Did you know that Jesus prayed for you to come to faith, to know him? When you go evangelize, keep that, that, those verses 20 to 23 in your mind. Jesus has prayed for the people I'm going to evangelize. It is his power that will transform their lives. I don't have to worry about my my fancy speech and my eloquence. I don't have to worry about whether I look sharp or whether I look shabby. I don't have to worry about anything that has to do with me except bringing this message clearly, and God will work. Do you see that prayer is answered when we share the gospel and people believe? God prays, Jesus prays for those future believers. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, 1 to 5 he says, for I, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is the message of the gospel that will save people and it's because Jesus prays for them to be saved. And then finally, Jesus prays for his disciples to see Jesus' glory one day. You want to go to heaven? You want to go to heaven? Well, in heaven, you will see the glory of Jesus. And that's why we should want to go to heaven, because we'll see the glory of Jesus. And so that's the structure of this prayer. And I hope you can see that when Jesus prays for his disciples to be sanctified by truth, this is a very intimate prayer. This is something that that should ring in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds as we hear these words. So let's look at the first thing here. There's there's two things I want us to see in this text. In particular, in verse 17, the first part, or the second, second part of verse 17, rather, where it says, your word is truth. Listen to that statement, the absolute statement here that Jesus makes. Jesus believes, in fact, that God's word is true. Why should you believe God's word is true? Because Jesus believes it's true. If any reason, you should believe it because Jesus believes it's true. Listen to this. Truth is mentioned 25 times in the Gospel of John. 25 times 
in the Gospel of John and 20 times in his letters. Compare, let's compare that to the rest of the Gospels. How important is truth to John? Let's compare it. It's mentioned, truth, the word truth is mentioned one time in the Gospel of Matthew. So, so far, 20 times more important than the book of Matthew. It's mentioned three times in the Gospel of Mark and Luke. So, so far, six times more important. Truth is more, six times more important to John than it is to Mark and Luke. It's mentioned 47 times in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Truth, the word truth. Do you see how important this word is in the New Testament? I hope you can see just by its usage that John really wants you to understand the truth. If this morning you have doubt about what truth is, let's, let's cover a couple of these. Let's cover a couple of these. Uh, the self-refuting truth claims. Here's, here's one of them. Uh, absolute truth does not exist, so Jesus' statement doesn't matter to me. Well, here's, the, here's my response. Your claim, that claim that absolute truth does not exist, is a, a, a claim of absolute truth. Do you notice that? That if I say uh, absolute truth doesn't exist, uh, that circumstances determine what truth is, do you realize that's an absolute claim? Uh, what about this one? This is a more humble approach to refuting Jesus' claims. We can't know anything for certain. We can't know if God's word is truly God's word because we don't have the archaeological evidence or the scientific evidence or whatever for whatever reason. Apparently, though, here's the response to that, that statement. Apparently, you can know something for certain, namely, that you don't know anything for certain. So if you say, ah, oh, well, you know, I, I, I like Jesus, what Jesus says as a teacher, but, you know, it's not really true, most of it, just because it was written by men sometime, you, you know, and men are fallible, you know, they're, they're not perfect. Um, you know, it's, so it's not God's word. If you, if you believe that and you say, well, you can't be for certain, actually, I'm, I'm agnostic about that. Well, I'll say to you, it sound, sure sounds like you're, you're certain about something, about your uncertainty. And what about the third one here? All truth is or needs to be scientifically testable. Here's the response to that one. That statement is not scientifically testable. So how do we, how do we as Christians navigate these truth claims that we hear all around us? What feels good, that's what's true. What about those things that don't feel good? Are those false? Well, if they're false, then why don't you feel good? If truth is tied to our circumstances, then what Jesus says here is not true. Why? Because God's word confronts us in our sin when it doesn't feel good and it's still true. But God's word also confronts us when we experience blessing and joy when it feels good. It's because God knows what we each need more than we know what we need. So God's word is true. And l listen to this. The doctrine, this is from the Reformation, the doctrine of sola scriptura, which is the word alone, the doctrine of sola scriptura in a nutshell asserts that scripture is our sole source of, source of normative, infallible revelation. In other words, it was given to us by God. That's what the reformers believed. And that all things necessary for salvation and concerning faith and life are taught in the Bible with enough clarity that the ordinary believer can find them there and understand. You see how liberating that is? You see how liberating that is to know that God's word is not just some abstract truth that's absolute and out there, but God's word is so near to us that even Jesus himself will, will say, God's word is true. The Bible is true. So as you read the Bible, as you think of this as your own sole source of truth, realize that God wrote it in such a way so you can understand. Um, I, I want to mention a reformer here, John Wycliffe. My, uh, my sister-in-law and her husband are missionaries in Africa. They're actually in, in, in an African country now, and they're Wycliffe Bible translators, and uh, they were, she came by for a day last week, and it was just a joy to, to hear about their, their uh, Bible translation progress. And they've already translated the Bible into the New Testament. Uh, people typically, they translate the New Testament first because we want people to hear the gospel of, of the Lord Jesus Christ first. And then we go back into the, to the Old Testament, and we 
share all these stories about God and, and how he reveals himself. And so they're working through the, the Old Testament now, and I was just talking to her about the impact that John Wycliffe has had. And this in particular, the need to hear, to see people hear the gospel and come to saving faith. Do you know how many people groups are in Africa that have not heard the gospel? Several thousand. And you know how many Bible translations are available in those languages? Zero. And so John Wycliffe, the legacy that he left behind is people need to get the truth in their hand. They need to get God's word in their hand through life or death. We need to bring it to the people. And so listen to what, to what happened with John Wycliffe. He was considered a heretic. Why? Why was he considered a heretic, a false teacher? Because he wanted to cha- translate the Bible into a language that was not holy like Latin. He wanted to translate it into English. And the Catholic Church said, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And at a council, they said, John Wycliffe, you're a heretic. When you die, we're going to take your body, we're going to burn it, and we're going to spread it in the, in a, in a river. Now, here's what, here's what John Wycliffe was referred to. He was referred to as the morning star of the Reformation, because he wasn't part of the Reformation. He died, and then 200 years later, the Reformation happened. But the morning star, that sliver of light, that hope at the end of the tunnel, John Wycliffe was that hope. And listen to this. This is a funny quote. Uh, a historian noticed that when um, John Wycliffe's body was burnt, that his body went into this river, and here's what he writes. They burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the river Swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus this brook hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, and Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed the world over. You see what happened? John Wycliffe died, didn't get to see the Bible translated into English completely. His followers took up that legacy. They spread it. It spread throughout the world. The influence took, the momentum took, and just like his ashes spreading into the whole world through the ocean, this momentum spread through the world so that my sister-in-law is in Africa this morning translating the Bible. Do you see how amazing that is? That this one man lit the fire that would start the Reformation. Um, By the way, there is a website, desiringgod.org. If you want to look at more reformers and their biographies, you can go to www.desiringgod.org and uh, slash here we stand. You gotta put it there, or you can just Google here we stand. And this surveys 31 profiles of reformers and what they did, and it's, it's very sh- it's sweet and short. So in two minutes, you can read one of these in the morning or so. And you can sign up for it to be automatically sent to you. But we need to understand that we stand on this legacy, that these reformers brought the word of God, they translated the word of God so that we could know it. And so John shows us that Jesus believes that God's word is true, and it's because that Jesus believed this that the reformers translated the Bible. And now in the book of John, truth, truth is so important. I've just given you a diagram there of how truth relates to Jesus Christ, how truth relates to the Father, how truth relates to the Spirit, and how truth relates to true Christians. And you'll notice there, for instance, that in John 1.14, truth refers to Jesus' essence and glory. Everything about Jesus is true. Uh, Truth also refers to Jesus as the one who brings grace and truth. Truth refers to Jesus and bearing witness to him. To speak truth of Jesus is to bear witness to the truth. Truth is Jesus' word as opposed to the devil's. Do you know this phrase here? The truth will what? Set you. Who said that? Jesus Christ, John chapter 8. It's because when you believe the truth, you come to a person, not to an abstract idea. And who sets you free? Jesus Christ. He sets us free. And then you see there in, uh, in that box under Jesus Christ, it says, truth of Jesus' word can set us free. Truth is the very essence of Jesus Christ. And to be of the truth is to listen to Jesus. And then you see there with the Father and the Spirit, you can 
go home and read those, but I want you to see how truth relates to true Christians in this book. How does truth relate to you this morning in the Gospel of John? How should you think about truth? Listen to this. Believers can be of the truth. They can be of the truth. Are you characterized by truth, brother and sister? Well, you can be of the truth. Listen to this one. Only true Christians hear Christ's voice, this voice of truth. Believers are set free by truth. Believers are sanctified in the truth. Believers can do the truth. Believers who worship in truth are sought by God. Believers worship in spirit and truth. Believers submit to the truth of Jesus exclusively. All those things are true for Christians. All of those things are important for Christians. How how do you do the truth of God? How do you follow the truth of God? How do you submit to it exclusively? How do you say, Jesus is the only object of my affection? Well, the Gospel of John tells us, you come to a person, not to an idea, when you come to truth. And so how do you come to this person? Let's, let's look first at truth and how it is ultimately about God as he is revealed in the Old and New Testaments. What is truth? Pilate asks Jesus. Truth is standing in front of him, and he asks, what is truth? And so often we look at Pilate and say, how could he ask such a, such a myopic question? How, how could he see truth? in person, and not understand that Jesus Christ is truth. I understand Jesus Christ is truth. It's because of our sin. It's because each of us has a very, very myopic view of God's glory in Jesus Christ. And you know what view we have very, very powerfully in our, in our focus? Ourselves. Somebody said it, ourselves. We look to ourselves, and instead of praying the way Jesus prayed, Father, glorify yourself in me, we say, Father, glorify me in me. We say, God, today I want the world to work in my favor. Uh, God, I thank you that you created the world so that it could serve my purposes. Of course, perhaps none of you would voice that. Maybe some of you would. But, but most of us probably wouldn't voice that, and yet it's true in our lives, isn't it? It's true because God works, God's word tells us that's true. If anybody should, should gain their life, if anybody should have their life, they're going to lose it. But if anybody should deny themselves for the sake of the gospel, they will have it. They will have their life. They'll have much more. They'll have eternal life. And so Jesus says, look, God's word is true, and God's word, con- God's word confronts you. It tells you, you're too much about yourself. And, and the solution is not to now think to, think, to try to think, okay, how can I be less about myself and more about God? That's not the solution either. Why? Because you're still thinking about yourself. The solution is to think of others, to think about how my life might glorify God in my service to others. And we see this in the person of God. We see that God is the very essence of truth because God creates a world that he doesn't even need. And he gives himself for this world. And God, in doing that, displays to us what it means to be God-like. It means to be others-oriented. The Father exalts the Son. The Son exalts the Father. The Spirit exalts the Father and the Son. And then I come and, and I'm in my, you know, come in my own little world and I want all three of them to exalt me. I want God through the Spirit to give me spiritual, supernatural gifts so that I can manifest my glory in the world. Or I want Jesus Christ to let me be a herald with my eloquence of the gospel to win people over because I'm so eloquent. Or I want the Father to say, everything I created was for you, man. I love you so much. I left heaven because I love you so much. That's what we think about God. That's what, you know, by the way, I was just reciting some popular worship songs that I hear on the radio. All of these songs point to me, me, me. And when in reality, Jesus says, no, 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 no. 
The Father glorifies himself by creating a world that he didn't need and then giving his Son for this world that he didn't need so that we would love him. And the Spirit manifests himself in us not so that we would have these spiritual gifts that demonstrate how amazing we are, but that demonstrate how dependent we are on the Spirit, that demonstrate my life is about Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does this Holy Spirit do in the book of John? He bears witness about the Son. What are you doing about Jesus Christ? Are you bearing witness about him? And so we see that truth is ultimately about God. This person, this God who gives himself. In the Old Testament, we see several times that God is a rock of truth, of faithfulness. That God in him, his person, is so for truth that he is utterly opposed to falsehood and lies. In fact, in the book of, if, if you look in the book of Psalms, the only thing that God says he expressly hates is liars. People who can't tell the truth. God is so true in his essence. Isaiah 65, 16 says it very clearly. God is the God of truth. Remember, we come to truth, we don't come to an idea, we come to a person. Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But truth in the Gospel of John also refers specifically to Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. By the way, all of Jesus' statements in the Gospel of John, when he says, I am, do you know what that points back to? Exodus 3, where God says, I am who I am. I am the cause of the universe. I am the beginning of all things. I am the one by whom all things are held together. And in Jesus Christ, you know what Jesus Christ does in the book of John? He says, I am everywhere. In case you missed it in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. I am the bread of life. I am living water. Come and eat. Come and drink. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Whoa, what a bold claim. Remember, he says, I am. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Is he the creator of the universe? Is he the cause of all things? Is he the beginning of all creation? Is he the essence of life itself? Well, Jesus Christ tells us that he came in the Gospel of John. He tells us he came to live, he came to die, and he, come, he came to be glorified. Do you love that Jesus Christ came to live in righteousness on your behalf because we couldn't do it? Do you love that? Do you love the fact that Jesus did it for us? Do you love the fact that Jesus died in our place? I am, the creator of the universe, dies on the cross. I am becomes nobody so that we can become the righteousness. Jesus Christ dies our death. Are you excited about Jesus' resurrection? Do you love that God rose Jesus from the dead because his sacrifice was sufficient, that the hour had come and was now fulfilled in his death? When we love the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know what we're saying? We're, we're saying to God, we're saying, you know all things. Your word is truth. I believe. In fact, that's why John wrote his gospel. He wants you to believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then be saved. Truth is truth because we come in contact with a person who is truth. So that's the first thing. Jesus believes that, that God's word is true. Jesus believes God's word is true. If, if that was surprising to you, well, it shouldn't be surprising to you. Jesus says your word is truth. Jesus believes God's word is true. And, and second place, Jesus wants true Christians to become holy through the truth. You see that in verse 17, first part? Sanctify them in the truth. In other parts of the Gospel of John, you see that uh, Jesus really is concerned with God's word. He's concerned that we, when we hear God's word, we do it. Jesus says several times in this Gospel, I just come to do what the Father tells me to do. That's all I'm doing. You know, there's a story of, of how Jesus comes into contact with some spiritual leaders and they say, Abraham is our father. And then Jesus says, well, if Abraham is your father, then you would believe in me because Abraham loved to see me. In fact, Abraham wrote about me. I mean, Abraham was looking for me. 
And they said, no, 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 that can't be possible. And you know, Jesus says to them, he says, you know why it's not possible that you don't believe that? Why you don't believe the truth? Is because your father is not Abraham and it's not God, it's Satan. I love Jesus' teachings. Do you love that teaching? Uh, Jesus says, your father is Satan, which is why you can't believe the truth. And in a true sense, that's, in a real sense, that's true of all of us, isn't it? Ephesians 2 says that we are all children of darkness. We are all following the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Satan. Uh, many of you probably wouldn't say, well, I worship Satan. But by our deeds, by our actions, by our lifestyle, the Bible shows us that if we do not submit to the truth, we are following Satan. He is our father. We are destined for wrath, is what Ephesians 2 tells us because of this. Now, what does Jesus say? Does Jesus pray, God, I want you to make them feel guilty because they don't know the truth? When referring to Christians, does he pray that? No. You know what he prays? It's sweet. He, he says, God, make them holy through your word. Jesus, does Jesus know what you need? Yeah, he does. He knows that our heart default is to go back into sin, to follow Satan. And yet, what does Jesus say? Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart. What does to sanctify mean? It means to set them apart, to make them holy, to dedicate them to God, to become like God, to make them fit for heaven. Whenever we use that language of sanctification, all we're saying is, are you different from the world and are you like God as a Christian? Are you others-oriented, right? We talked about others being others-oriented. Are you, do you love other people and seeing their needs met more than your own? Do you love, do you love the fact that other people have greater needs than you and though you have needs, your call is to serve those needs without ever expecting to be returned that favor? Do you love that? Well, Christ tells us to be holy is to be like God, to give up your needs, to love God, to trust him, to follow him, even when you don't get anything in, in return. And how much do we get in return? The fact that this prayer is answered today in your hearing of God's word is marvelous. We sang about marvelous grace. How are you transformed? How will you be a better Christian tomorrow? How will you stop getting angry? How will you stop being so abrasive? How will you stop being so impatient? How will you stop being so flustered? How will you stop being so anxious? How will you stop being so, so angry? It's through coming in contact with truth. Truth is a person. It's through coming to know Jesus Christ. And it's through his word that God intends for us to become holy. Perhaps you were thinking, no, God intends for me to be holy through an experience. No, God intends for me to be holy through a relative. Certainly, people can make us want to be holy. And certainly, experiences can cause us to be holy. Anybody, you know, who's a parent? You know, the biggest prayer I have is, Lord, please make me holy. Because every moment I feel like being a parent is just, is a tug of war. You know, in fact, they do say marriage and parenting are the greatest obstacles to sanctification, but the greatest fruit of sanctification as well. And so you see that holiness comes through experience and through the influence of others. But you know where it comes from primarily? Through immersing yourself in God's word. That's what Jesus wants you to do as a result of this. He wants you to go home and read the word and to say, Lord, how can I be more like you and less like me? How can I be more like you and less like the world? You know what the problem is in evangelical churches today, which is why we're going into a dark age, which is why we need to reform? The church is saying, how can we become more like the world so that the world can become more like Jesus? Instead of saying, how can we become more like Jesus so the world can become more like Jesus? You see the problem? The problem is not that we, we want to be like Jesus so much that it changes the world around us. That's not the problem. That would be a good problem. That would be great. In fact, that would be biblical. But you know what we want? We want to become so much like the world so that they become like Jesus. That goes counter to what Jesus says here. 
He does not say sanctify them by their influence, by the way they dress in accordance with the world, by the movies they watch to become relevant to the world, by the, by the things they do with their bodies to become relevant, by their sexuality. He doesn't say any of that. That is not how we're going to win the world. What does verse 18 say? What does verse 18? Look at that verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. God does not need more missionaries on the field or in our local area who are going to try to become relevant like the culture to win people over to Christ. He needs people who are holy to win people to Christ. He needs you and me to live a life of holiness so that we can become the salt of the earth, the light of the world. If salt has lost its taste, how much impact are we going to have? If light is put under a basket, under a bed, how can you be a morning star of a reformation? You can't. Holiness. Holiness. Have you ever come into contact with a holy person? Holy people, people who are like God, are so about God's purposes, aren't they? You know this. When a person who's holy walks into the room, you can look at them and say, that person is so about other people. He is so about, he or she is so about God's purposes, about God, doing God's business. I hope that can be true of us, brothers and sisters. I hope that can be true of Sheridan Hills. This church is characterized by truth and holiness. Finally, we want to look at application. We want to look at application. How does God's word sanctify me? How does God's word sanctify me? You know, there's a, gr a great book by Kevin DeYoung. Uh, we've read several books by him. There's a book in our bookstore called Whole in Our Holiness. And if you want to learn more about holiness, what that means to be a Christian, uh, that's a great book. It's available in our bookstore. This one is not. Anna Zyder told me to, not, to say this is not available in the bookstore. It might be eventually, but listen to what Kevin DeYoung writes in this book, Taking God at His Word. Ultimately, we believe the Bible because we believe in the power and wisdom and goodness and truthfulness of the God whose authority and veracity cannot be separated from the Bible. We trust the Bible because it is God's Bible. And God being God, we have every reason to take him at his word. I hope this book is helpful. You can take a picture of it or you can just write it down, Taking God at His Word. It's a, it's a helpful book to see how should Christians think about God's word as true. And so uh, one, of the th one of the ways that we can apply what Jesus prays here, one of the ways that we can follow this prayer that, and answer this prayer is this way, by asking these three questions. What should I believe about the word of God? What should you believe about the word of God? I think we should believe three things. We should believe it's true. We should believe it's relevant and we should believe it's good. We should believe it's true, it's relevant, and good. I hope you can see that Jesus wants us to love God's word, to not just, to not just look at God's word as a, a book, 66 books, but to look at God's word as the source of all truth, as the guiding principle when life is difficult, when life is good as the source of all that is good. God's truth is any word he speaks, and it is true, it is relevant, and it is good. So you should believe that. Second place, I think you should also feel, what should we feel toward the word of God? What should we feel toward the word of God? In a, in a culture ruled by feelings and not by thought, we can easily lose sight of what I mean. I don't mean like when you wake up in the morning, you look at the Bible, you're like, I don't feel like reading the Bible because I'm tired. I'm not talking about that feeling. Those feelings that keep us away from God's word, we should repent of. But what are some commands in the scriptures that tell us how we should view. Anybody ever heard of Psalm 119? Psalm 119, longest chapter in the dedicated to how good the Bible is. Do you know that in the book, in, the, in Psalm 19, 119 and in the uh, Psalms and throughout the Bible, 
we're commanded to delight in the word of God. We're commanded to depend on the word of God. We're commanded to desire the word of God. How can you demand feeling? How can you demand feeling? How can you tell somebody who's sad, be happy? How can you tell them that? Is it easy to do that? No, but here's how you do it. Immerse yourself in God's word. Look at it and say, my, my obedience this morning is to delight in God's word. Because when I delight in God's word, it brings glory to God. My, my obedience right now today is to depend on God in this very trying circumstance. We'll look at a minute at what we should do with God's word, but have you memorized scripture? Have you memorized in the darkest moments of your life scriptures that come to mind? God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth give way, though the earth is swallowed into the heart of the sea. I'm not going to fear. God is my refuge and strength. Do you depend on God's word? Do you desire God's word? Psalm 19 says, I love your word like honey. It drips from the honeycomb. Do you ever see honey dripping from a honeycomb? Maybe this morning as you were putting in your coffee or tea. Honey drips, and that's God's word. It's so desirable. What about this? Last question. What should I do with the word of God? What should I do with the word of God? You should speak it. You should obey it. You should study it. You should sing it. You should pray. You should share and memorize God's word. All those things are things that we can do with God's word. Maybe you, you could write there off to the side in big capital letters, read it. In our bookstore, we have a huge section dedicated to Bibles. Why? It's because the Bible is what will transform us. It's because the Bible is what Jesus thought was God's word, true word. What do I believe about the Bible? What do I feel about the Bible? And what do I do with the Bible? Those are questions that you need to ask yourself. Sheridan Hills, here's what we think, here's what we feel, and here's what we do with God's word. We believe it's true, it's relevant, it's good. We delight, depend, and desire it. We speak it, we obey it, we sing it, we study it, we pray it, we share it, we memorize it, all for God's glory, so that Jesus' prayer can be answered in our doing. Jesus' prayer can be answered in our church. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. Listen to this, Psalm 119, verse 160. Listen to this. The sum of your word is truth. The sum of your word is truth, all of it. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. When you come into contact with truth, you come to a person. When you come into contact with truth, you don't come to an abstract idea. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ who calls us to repent and believe the truth. Let's pray together.